Hi, and welcome to the Teacher Support Podcast brought to you by New Teacher University, and I'm your host and principal, Dr. Terry Ross. Today, we're going to continue our series on teacher wellness. It's something that is so important. And as we're going into the 24-25 school year, we want to make sure that we open the school year with teacher wellness, making sure that our teachers put themselves first because if our teachers are well taken care of, they can take care of our children better and therefore the entire school community will be in good hands. And today I have with me a guest that I'm so excited to have. Her whole life is built around wellness and education. She is a former principal at the elementary, middle, and alternative level administrator. And she's also a former English teacher. And I I always say that English teachers intimidate me because they have too many words. So so we have Dr. Jewel White Williams with us today. She is the founder and owner of Black Tie Legacy that focuses on wellness and rural communities. And today she's going to talk about the principal's role in teachers' wellness and self-care. And we need to do this, focus on this from the top. Our teachers should know that we care about them. If the teachers know that we care about them, they will move mountains for our students. We don't have to worry about test data. We don't have to worry about school, culture, and climate. It will take care of itself. It's a byproduct of what we do at the top. So I'm not going to talk any more about uh, our topic. I'm going to turn it over to our expert, Dr. Jewel White Williams, founder and owner of Black Tie Legacy. Dr. Williams, tell us who you are, why did you start this company, and what are you doing now? Dr. Terry, thank you so much for allowing me to be on your amazing podcast. I am thrilled, number one, excited about what I'm going to be displaying and telling people about. And your podcast and your platform is what is so needed for our early career teachers, those who are teachers who are in the first or third third year. And I love that. That's the the pivotal part, isn't it, Dr. Terry? That's it. It's almost like uh, they say if you get a fresh uh, high school student through their freshman year, that they are 60% more likely, and it may be even more than that, to graduate from high school. So if we get those teachers through those first few years, that we're going to make sure that they stay in the profession. But what I want to uh, what I what I want to exponentiate most of all is that teacher wellness is something new. It's not new, but there's not enough people focusing on it. So this podcast tonight is for all teachers what you will be sharing. So whatever wellness strategies that Dr. Jewel White Williams will share tonight, principals, we want you to know that not just for your new teachers, it's for all of your teachers. So let's go. So, Dr. Terry, one thing I want to let your audience know is that when I was a principal, even an assistant principal, that I realized that the wellness of who we were uh, mattered greatly. We focused on the wellness of kids, having so many farm to table opportunities, bringing in field day, having our health and wellness weeks. Um, and, And it made me start thinking about how can I ensure that we as an administrator can ensure that we're meeting the needs of our community. And when I talk about community, I'm talking today about our teacher community. Yes. So I do have three points that I would like to focus on. The first one is leading a culture of wellness. The second one is health insights and interactions. And the third one is called the cognitive growth of our new teachers. And all three of them will kind of work hand in hand. Absolutely. I love those topics. I love those topics. And what's the first one? The first one is leading a culture of wellness. Leading a culture of wellness. Thank you so much for that. That's an entire podcast by itself. Yes. And that's what I love talking about. That's what I love talking about. I talk about it often because I feel that as a principal, we have to lead by wellness. I'm not saying we all have to be slim and trim. But it's the mindset in which we have with leading by wellness. When I talk about understanding proactive wellness, I'm talking about the role of a principal in promoting a culture of wellness in the in the in the actual uh, environment. Yes, absolutely. Uh, When I talk about that, I'm also talking about how we plan as principals. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I really uh, encouraged and and let my faculty know during the time that I was a principal, um, we as principals go to our big admin meetings in the beginning of the year. 
And this is the opportunity for principals to really get themselves situated. So you sit down, they give you a plan of everything they want you to do. And they tell you when the professional development days are. Yes. And then we as principals know we have to offer professional development as well in our schools, especially on certain days as well. Mm -hmm. And then, we, of course, we have our after school faculty meetings, which are and, and it depends on the system that you're in. But you have your professional development after school at least once a month. And sometimes twice, depending on whatever is going on, especially if it's a hot month. Yes. So this is one thing that I always talk about for school principals is create your activity calendar that is specifically for your teachers. And what do I mean by that? So one thing that I did is in our actual notebook, our teacher notebook, because they got our notebook or and they could also get it online as well. They received a professional development calendar for the entire year. Yes. Why? I gave them the professional development calendar ahead of time because I wanted them to know what days I needed them to be with me so they could schedule their appointments. We're talking about schedule their dental appointments. They could schedule their wellness appointments, their eye appointments, their mammograms, their ENT appointments. They can schedule their children's appointments around what's going on. So it cuts out saying, hey, I need that day off. They know when the actual professional development is happening. So you're promoting that culture of wellness saying, hey, I value you because I'm letting you know ahead of time. I'm not going to spring it on you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, and that way it, it helps them implement their regular check-ins. They can do their wellness assessments right then and there at a regular basis. So that's one of the key things that I wanted to put in place. And I told my teachers that I said, you know, I'm planning mine around the various days because I don't want you to have to use your vacation days to take a doctor's appointment. I really don't want you to. I want you to use it for vacation. Absolutely. And that's what I want them to use it for. That's how a principal should speak to their faculty. Use your vacation days for just that vacation resting, promoting that mindset of, I guess you say growth and rest and rejuvenation. So when they come back into that classroom, they are there with yes. you. And it's so hard as a new teacher, you want to just go ahead and do everything you could think of. You want to, I remember yeah, I was sitting there and I was doing great in papers during my vacation. I was putting my classroom together again. I was looking, it was just nonstop. But that creates an opportunity for sickness. And you don't want that for your new teachers. Absolutely. So one part of that wellness and interaction is looking at the teacher collectively. So I always met with my new teachers and I planned their year of how I would follow them and how they would also have mentors as well. Um, and I had like a once a month, a meeting where we would talk about when are you taking time for yourself? Yes. What are you doing right now? That personal touch. And I think that's really important. That's one of the key things I love about it. Absolutely. And it is so important to make sure that they know upfront everything that they're going to do for the year. And if there are any aha moments for me, it was for me to say, today, we're not having the meeting. Who are you telling? We did it during the PLCs. <laughs> and so now you have this time off. Yes. That, yes. That's the Who surprise. That's yes. the surprise for them. And not only did I make sure they knew all of the meetings for the year, the coaches had to make sure that the, the, the schedules for any events were out at the beginning of the year. And yes. teachers could sign up for what football, basketball games they were going to show up for, any activities that we were going to have, like if we were going to have something around homecoming. All of those activities were at the beginning of the year. Teachers signed up for them so that they can know, like, let's say if it was a policy that you're going to do at least three uh, activities outside mm -hmm. of that a year, you mm -hmm. knew what days your three activities were on. And if you couldn't be there, then you could switch out with somebody else if an aha came up and you all worked that out together. But my yes. biggest thing was making sure that they had some free time that they didn't know about. That yes. they can just say, oh, my God, I needed this time today. I can remember the first time it was in 2014 uh, when I first got to the school. It was just customary that they have faculty meeting every Wednesday. And about I think it was maybe we started school mid-August. 
So it was maybe like mid-September, and I was like, do we need a faculty meeting today to my admin team? And they said, well, we really don't. We just usually have them. And I said, well, today I'm going to send out a memo, and it's going to be a virtual faculty meeting. And everything they need to know will be on that memo. And I got on the intercom and I said, and today faculty meeting is canceled. We're having a virtual faculty meeting and uh, just check your email. They checked their emails the next morning. I got hugs. I, I got thumbs up. <laughs> I got thank yous because they were so excited about that. And from that, I moved faculty meeting to once a month. And then sometimes we didn't have to have faculty meeting once a month because our PLCs and our ILTs were so well tuned and our ILTs is what informed the PLC meetings that we would mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. And so if you're having those professional learning community uh, meetings and you're, they're properly scheduled and you're doing what you're supposed to do in them, you may not have to have a faculty meeting because everything that you're doing is built around instruction. It is. And all of the activity things, we had someone in charge of that and they were getting paid a stipend. So thank you so much for this piece on leading a culture of wellness. And I didn't think about leading a culture of wellness being around how you plan the year. That yeah. is so important. And you it said, is. and you said about, you said, you talked about teachers taking vacation days. They don't have vacation days. They have sick days. Mm -hmm. That's all they have on the book, sick days. And that's something that we need to shift. We need to call those vacation days because if a teacher take a day off to go on a cruise, I know teachers that have gotten fired because they took two of their days to go on a cruise and posted a picture. Not in my district, but I've just heard about it in the country. Those days should be for whatever reason a teacher need those days. They should mental be. health wellness day. What are you talking about? <laughs> Absolutely. I needed those two days in October. My family wanted to go on a cruise. I'm not going to miss that cruise because I need to take sick days. I got to pretend that I'm sick and now I can't post on my gram or whatever I like to post on. <laughs> so it is so important that we re we rethink education all together when it comes to teachers. And this group of teachers that we have now, millennials, they're not having it. Oh, they really aren't. They really aren't. And I think that's one of the things that I believe principals really and truly need to uh, not necessarily say they have to follow along with what they're doing, but they need to be aware of what they're doing so they can plan accordingly and work with them with that. I used to do virtual meetings. My virtual meetings are a little bit different, Dr. Terry. Well, now this was 2014 before virtual meetings were a virtual thing, but let's talk Same about Same here. It. Same here. Talk about it. So... My virtual meetings, I did a recording. And uh -huh. when they did the recording, in order to gain access, they had to sign in. I had a platform. Now, I can't remember yes. the name of it, but they had to sign in to the platform. And at the end, I had a mini quiz. We're talking about five questions. Mm -hmm. Then that way, I knew they watched it. And they had a certain amount of time to finish it. And I made it for like 10 minutes, maybe, of that. Mm -hmm. So they could watch it on their phone if they wanted to. Yes. So okay. that was one. That's one other way. I'm just sneaking that one in there, you know. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Adding a little accountability. But I didn't want to make sure if they wanted to read that memo in the car, they could do it. And it took them three minutes. That's what I wanted them to have because we had gotten everything we needed during the school day. So yes. thank you for sharing that because that does add a layer of accountability to it. So let's move into strategy two. What's strategy two? So I talk about healthy insights. We're talking about emotional intelligence. And the reason I'm talking about emotional intelligence as a role of an instructional leader is because we have to foster understanding and support between the teacher and the principal. So when we look at that holistically, when we look at it holistically, we have to consider the challenges that are there, the opportunities that new teachers have. We have to build support and we have to, when we build that support, you have to show that there's some trust. Yes. But when we talk about emotional intelligence, we're talking about a cognitive state. Yes. We're talking about metacognition. Yes. You got me? We're talking yes. about empathy and we're talking about effective communication. So when we talk metacognition, and I love talking about that part, is thinking about your thinking. So as a principal, we are, forgive me for saying this, we're a little ADHD at moments because we have so much on our mind. We have to make quick decisions. But when we're with our new teachers, we need to be cognizant of where we are mentally and making sure that we are there for them, number one. Because if you're not, then being emotionally intelligent with that teacher or that group of new teachers, then you're not going to relay the message that you need to relay. Because yes. you have to read their body language. You have to hear what they're saying. 
you also have to see what they're writing or how they're interacting in the classroom and then understanding whether or not their emotions are taking the best of them. So emotional intelligence is important because you want to see whether or not you can identify the challenges that they have. You can see where they need support. And that's why I say your form as a principal, as a leader, being emotionally intelligent comes through from your walkthroughs. Yes. So you have to be empathetic. I also say it could be also called empathetic leadership where you have the ability of understanding his or her needs, that teacher's needs. If you go through, I know, it, trust me, it's very difficult. And I didn't have an assistant principal. It was just me. So when I went in, I had to make it very, very known of when I was going in. I had to be very planned. I had to plan everything out. But I knew it was important for me to be in that new teacher's classroom at least once a week for at least the first four weeks. Because if anything goes down, you need to know immediately. And then you need to know where their needs are and then hold that new teacher meeting to discuss some of the challenges within the first week to see how the body language is, see where they're, how they're, how they're walking in the door. Yes. Believe it or not, as you're standing there, you can see whether or not that teacher is ready to, to go to class and to teach that child or those children. And so being emotionally aware of where your teachers are is a big concept, is a healthy insight. You're looking at their health through their eyes and through their actions. Absolutely. Are they walking through the door looking excited and ready to go or did they just drag in? And it's important, I call it, can you read the room? Mm -hmm. Can you read the room? And when you see that, can you help regulate? Because social emotional intelligence, a lot of that is about you regulating and helping this the new teacher self-regulate yes. and helping the students self-regulate as well. And I've been doing a lot of work around uh, social emotional intelligence lately. And it's a huge piece that's missing in the world. That's why we're having so many meltdowns in public. And it's, it's huge when you have a big grown man out walking around and they may have a weapon on them and they don't know how to regulate. Because the next thing, that's why we're having so many uh, shootings and things like that, because we're not teaching children how to regulate. And if we're looking at the teachers and helping them regulate, sometimes going to by the classroom and telling them, hey, take a step out for a second. One of the things that I did in my as I was a principal and I did it religiously is I walked around to almost every classroom every morning. And I can say every classroom every morning. I just stick my head in the door. It's just That's a like five second stick in. Hey, how's it going? And I can see. Then I do it again, maybe before lunch and then maybe after lunch. And what I would call that, I had a mentor one time to tell me what I'm doing is I'm putting together a snapshot of what the day looks like in that classroom. Because mm -hmm. I felt like any paperwork that I needed to do in that office could wait. You know, I hear a lot of principals saying, oh, I have so much paperwork to do. I never understood what all that paperwork was because everything that comes in that building, it has something to do with some other department. And I trusted my departments to get it done. I didn't feel like I needed to was something around uh, counseling, I gave it to the counselors. Tell me, what do you need to make this happen? If it was something around attendance, it went to the person that handled attendance. If it was something around transportation, who's handling transportation? Let's get that done. And so that's how I, I made that happen. And it was my job to make sure that those common areas of the building, I always told teachers, I'm going to make sure that this the culture and climate in these common areas are done very well. Therefore, you can only focus, you, all you have to focus on is your classroom. So thank you for making sure that you sat with those new teachers in the beginning of the year and that you help them plan, that you help them to help regulate how they came in the building, how they presented themselves in the classroom. Because students are also reading to know whether or not they can get away with some things if that teacher is not showing up fully present. And the only way that we can have teachers be fully present is if we, as the administrators, are fully present. And that's so true. Uh, children will identify what's wrong immediately. Yes. Uh, they are your regulator. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you don't regulate, they will regulate for right, you. Right. And forgive me, all of a sudden I'm thinking of a song. But anyway, but they will regulate you automatically. And they're your temperature gauge. Yes. And they'll feed off of your body language, your eyes, your emotions, everything. So that's the reason why sometimes when the teacher would come in, I would 
try my best to see what was happening, but nine times 10, I was greeting, greeting, greeting the students and their parents at the car. At, and then I would try to meet some of the kids at the bus area because I had to use my faculty as best as I can. As I stated, I didn't have, my team was very small. It was me. And then I had my instructional teacher uh, who worked on technology and my counselor. And then my secretaries, that's all I could do. And it didn't matter. I still needed to find out the temperature of the school on that particular day. Absolutely. So I had a new teacher one time and she was kind of a firecracker. And uh, one morning I spoke to her and she didn't speak and she just got into the building. She came mid-year, transferred from another school. At the time, I didn't know why she transferred. And I stopped back by her room later that day. I said, I spoke to you this morning and you didn't speak. Is everything okay? And she just looked at me and said, well, I didn't want to speak. I said, oh, that's not a part of our culture here. We speak to each other here. And she went to HR about it. And HR called me and asked me, is it important that she speaks? I said, yes, it is. Because if the students see us treating each other like that, then what are they going to do? Culture starts at the top. It's just like in a home. If you go to a home and the children are out of control, Mm -hmm. You can look at the parents. I don't care yes. what the parents say. You can look at what are the parents doing in that home. Yeah. So if you go to a school and that school is out of control, look at the culture of the adults in the building. And it was always very important for me as an administrator that we put forth a united front. It didn't matter if we liked each other or not. There you go. We're going to be kind, <laughs> not necessarily nice. But we're going to be kind to each other Respectful. and we're going to put forth the united front and showing that we know how to regulate and that we know how to treat each other. So, yes, it is important that we speak to each other in the building. It's important that we pass out niceties and 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 and, and, and recognize each other as we're moving through the building. So thank mm -hmm. you with that for that. No problem. But no let's problem. move into strategy three. Thank you so much. The, the third one is called cognitive growth for new teachers. And the reason I say that is we get that mental process that happens with our new teachers, where they're coming out of college, or if they're not coming from a teaching part of college, like they're not going for a teaching college or actually getting their teaching degree. If they're coming from the business side and coming in, regardless of route. how, yeah, yes. regardless, you got to keep that in mind because we're getting from both angles. There's going to be a theoretical gap between theoretical knowledge and how they think versus reality. Yes. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> Let's not talk about reality in a school. <laughs> <laughs> I got to be real on this though. Yes. It's the truth. It's the truth. There's going to be a gap there. Yes. Be like, so I call it kinship, you know? Yes. You have uncle and you have your nephew. Yes. All right. And uh, Elk's going to be kind of cool, laid back. The nephew's going to be like, oh, this is how it is. He thinks yes. that's the reality. Yeah. Uh-uh. We got to be very careful and make sure we're able to infer. The teacher is able to infer the difference and have deductive reasoning skills, and they're using appropriately. So they're going to face challenges. And understanding that cognitive challenge that they're going to have as well. So not only they're trying to learn a brand new curriculum, they're also going to have challenges of the culture, like you stated, of the school. They're going to have challenges because each school is different. Regardless of the county, each school has its own culture and each county has its own culture, but each school has its own culture and that have to adapt to that culture of the school, like you stated, but they also have to adapt to the curriculum, which is new to them. Yes. And then they have to realize, I can't just teach. I've got to be real with the kids, but professionally. And how can they develop that cognitive resilience and adaptability? That's what you're going to have to do as a principal to help them with that wellness. So when I talk about wellness, I'm talking about the mind. And that's the piece that I want to, that's the piece that I'm focusing on is making sure that they receive the appropriate professional development in regards to cognitive skills and understanding how their ther theoretical knowledge itself can adapt to the reality of what's actually happening in the classroom. And you have to help them bridge it so that they are meshed together. Yes, you're talking about metacognition when you're dealing with the students, thinking about thinking about the students. Yeah, I'm yes. sorry, I had to say it. I love yes. it. And, and I love that you said that because it's important for principals, and that's why I'm I'm kind of refocusing this podcast so that principals can also watch it because teachers are leaders and leaders are teachers. And if the leaders are not teaching their teachers, 
The teachers may come up short when it comes to strategies. See, if you've been around for a while, you can come in and maybe shoot from the hip some days. But a new teacher, there's nothing in the hip pocket. There's nothing there but what they've walked in with. So when we walk in and we're doing those observations and we're just doing those pass throughs that we're saying hello, as we see things, it's important that we have the skill set and the courage to have those conversations with those teachers and say, hey, you know, when I passed by this morning and I saw David doing X, Y, Z, that would have been a perfect time for you to say this or say that to them. Right, right. And now right. you're giving them something. You're, you're filling their toolbox. So it's important for principals to think about that cognitive piece of the teacher. So carry on. I'm sorry. You are fine, Dr. Terry. Yes. That's the reason why we're here, because we want the principals to relate to what you and I are talking about. We understand where they've been. We know what it's like to have teachers there who are struggling and you want to gain them and get them back and get them back quickly because your first four to six weeks, regardless of a nine week schedule or a six week uh, semester, you want to get them immediately because you, the teacher's going to lose their kids in the first two weeks, no matter what. So if they haven't gained that rain immediately, then you got to find a way to get it sooner than later within that first two weeks. And you're going to have to work with not only just their knowledge base, the reality of everything, dealing with their cognitive skills as well, and their emotional intelligence. So you're looking at all of that. So you want to prevent what's happening and be able to recognize the signs of need build a supportive network and provide various tools that your community, meaning I'm talking about your school system has to help that new teacher. Absolutely. Filling that toolbox is so important. And, uh, and we call it the first six weeks of school. I know that the, there are several companies out and we know about Harry Wong and his book, the first six weeks of school, but I, I this the responsive school uh, movement they have the first six weeks of schools as well. And they said it's the first six weeks in elementary, but at the secondary level, it's the first three weeks of school. I say two. Yes, 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 yes. And if I you can, if you can make it through those really well and have them really solid, and those were the places that we helped our teachers plan. We make sure that activities that they had, uh, engagement activities like turn and talk, elbow partner, things like that, so that they can keep the students moving. They knew strategies like jigsaw. Because yeah, even yeah, at the secondary yeah. level, we may not have heifers like at the elementary level, like who's the line leader and things like that. But every day you need some students engaged in that classroom and some leadership type roles that's going to make them feel like they're part of the class, that's going to pull them into the class. So it's very important that we make it through those first three, first two weeks, as you say, but definitely mm -hmm. the first six weeks of school. It doesn't matter, as you stated, whether it's not if you're on a nine week quarter, those first six weeks are pivotal for the rest of the school year. And I would much rather teachers go slow during those mm -hmm. first six weeks so that they can go fast the rest of the year than for them to jump in on that first day. And, oh, let's hit the curriculum. No, on those first days of school, <laughs> we're building relationships. We're teaching routines. And I would tell teachers, OK, if they walk in that classroom and everybody didn't come in and go through the routine that you just explained, you just say, OK, everybody gather your things. We're going to go back in the hall and we're going to come back in until you get this right. Yes. And if you spend a class period doing that six times, somebody's going to get tired and they're going to look over at Terry and say, hey, Terry, look, you need to come <laughs> in and do X, Y, Z. So the students will help regulate each other because they're tired of getting up and coming in and out of their classroom. But That's at true. least they know what's important and repetition matters. So we want to make sure new teachers and even seasoned teachers, because there are some seasoned teachers that still struggle with classroom oh, management. Yes, I was going to say, I know we talk about the new teachers, but... Um, if you have a new teacher and sometimes they can be from a transfer from another school district, they can be a transfer from within the county. Um, and, and you realize that their the transfer was intentional. Yes. Um, so you can invite them to the new teacher part because they're a new teacher in your building. Keep yes. that in mind. So often people are saying, well, they're not a, they're not a new teacher. They're seasoned. Well, instead of them being in the program and your site, Talk about your school base program yes. for the entire school year because I'm going to have my new teacher curriculum that I create as a principal. And of course, the school system, I have their own. 
but mine is for the culture of my site base. You can have for the seasoned teacher who's new to your building, they can just stay up to it for the first semester or the first semester and that's it. Or, you know, they can stay in it for 18 weeks or something like that. But yes. don't disregard them because you have new things that are happening at school. They still need to know the nuances of what's happening in the school and the culture. Absolutely. And sometimes you may just have to invite them in for certain meetings. Like I need you to drop in this meeting today because we're, we're talking about this topic and I think you'll benefit from it. Yes. A absolutely. Yes. So thank you for sharing that. Is there anything else that you'd like to share? We've shared our three strategies. Is there anything else that you'd like to say to principals to help them get the school year open and ready for our students and making sure that our teachers self-care and wellness is at the forefront of what they're doing? Don't feel like you have to do it on your own. You can actually have your nurse work with you. That's what I did. My nurse worked with me and I also had some other teachers work with me about creating wellness programs throughout the year. And so we would have like a wellness week, of course, but get make it a fun thing. Don't make it feel like, oh, this is how it is. You know, we have to have this. We have to, no, make it fun, include everybody. But there is one key thing, if there's anything else that I could offer. And I say this to most of the people that I speak to. As a principal, you need to be aware of whatever your EAP is, your employee assistance program is, and yes. understand that your HR director is your key. So if there is something that you see that is critical and you are probably not in the place to address it, be sure to contact HR. And the reason I say that I'm talking about wellness, um, there are times that you may need to have say, hey, I need you to talk to XYZ, you know, Mr. Joe or Mr. Him, uh, because you're just concerned about how they are put together, how they're looking, how they're presenting toward others. Um, and so keep that in mind, even though we're talking about new teachers, this is a struggle for many of them and uh, it can play a huge role in their mindset and how they think about him or herself. Cause uh, what the words that we use are gonna have to be a little more nurturing because they're gonna get enough from the parents, enough from the teachers. So as principals, we've kind of got to work with them as well as their mentors. Absolutely. And principals know that it's okay for you to go to EAP. Know that it's okay for you to take a moment. And one of the things that I did as we opened the school year, I opened the school year. Yeah, the day started at 830, mm -hmm. but it may have been 1030 by the time we got into professional development because I invited someone on the staff that may have been a yoga instructor. We're going to do about 10 minutes of yoga. We're going to do a few minutes of this. We're going to, we, and I told everyone to wear athletic wear. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. And also throughout the school year, I had a family engagement person, a uh, specialist, and she would, uh, I would give her money to go to Sam's and pick up a salad for the teachers. I would ask some of our uh, school adopters to donate some money. And we had gotten it down that we could fix a salad for the teachers for about $125 because oh, I had good. a pretty large staff. But yeah. you're looking at just bags of lettuce yeah. and some toppings, <laughs> yeah. you know. Oh, no, it's the truth. Yeah. Instead of a taco bar, let it be a lettuce bar. I, 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 absolutely. And so you're looking at toppings now and then teachers would really appreciate it. And then on the Fridays that teachers didn't get paid, I would pop popcorn. Oh, that's awesome. And I, and I didn't know that I was doing it on the Fridays. It was just kind of be on that all Friday. And I realized that that all Fridays, the Friday had no money is circulating. <laughs> and use your PTA too, because being that I had a, I was the only principal and I didn't have any assistance, my PTA, and like I said, my staff kind of worked together. So your PTA can also help you with some of those things. Like if you did want to do a popcorn Friday, so I yes. uh, used to have a popcorn machine, you could probably find someone, a parent who's part of the PTA who can actually pop the popcorn. That Absolutely. Friday. Absolutely. You know, that's what I'm saying. Use your resources that you yes. have. You don't have, just because you are creating a wellness program slash plan or yes. keeping the new teacher part use the people that you have that are in your community to help absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And and I would like, I, they would see me getting started, but then I would turn it over to my fam my parents specialist. I thought it was important for my teachers to see me doing certain things for them because I wanted them to know that it's okay to stop in the day to do some things because what you'll find out is that when you don't focus, I, I never opened the school year focusing on test scores. We didn't talk about test scores until January because if you're doing what you're supposed to do, those test scores are going to take care of themselves. Running around all your test scores, test scores. When you just say that word, it brings up that level of uh, stress in teachers. So you bring the stress level down 
And then the test scores are a byproduct because the students will engage more when they don't see a stressed out teacher all the time. Students stressing out teachers, like you said, students are going to regulate for you if you're not regulating. Exactly. So that was one of the things that we did. So I'm so glad that you joined us today, Dr. Jewel White Williams, talking about teacher self care and wellness. Dr. Jewel White Williams is the owner and founder of Black Tie Legacy that focuses on wellness in rural communities. So let's make sure that you get her information at the end of this podcast. You will see how to contact her if you need to get in contact with her to come into your buildings. And wellness is not just for rural communities. That's just what she focuses on. Any school district can contact yes. her. So again, thank you so much, Dr. Jewel White Williams, for joining us on the Teacher Support Podcast, brought to you by New Teacher University. And I'm your principal and host, Dr. Terry Ross. And remember that some student comes to school every day because of you. So when you take care of yourself and you're able to be there and you're able to be present and whole, imagine what you're doing for that students. And that's how you leave your legacy. Thank you for joining us here today on the Teacher Support Podcast. And thank you, Dr. Jewel White-Williams. Thank you.